posted on uh, also the, the plants are posted on uh, my uh, YouTube page if you ever want to look for them. Um, we're going to start with Mark 14, 12 through 17. If you can turn there. And uh, we've got a little bit of a late start and a lot to cover. And I'm just going to give a little update or a little preview to Mark 14. What happened? Uh, we looked at last week uh, the original Passover, and we know that they brought the lamb into the house on the tenth day. Uh, it was to stay with them until the end of the thirteenth day, and the beginning of the fourteenth day was Passover every year. Turns out that this year Passover is on the same day as it is uh, was in Jesus' time when he was crucified. So Thursday was Passover, although the Jewish Passover starts at night. So they start about their day about six hours before we start our day. Their day starts at sundown, so you'll see that even today, the Jewish Passover starts at sundown, Wednesday night. That can be confusing, and it is confusing, and the Bible is written with these things in mind. Uh, so basically, we're going to go over some of that to help uh, clear up some of the confusion, but it still is a little confusing to keep track of the fact that that might be Tuesday and it might be Wednesday, depending on whose clock you're using. And uh, the Jewish clock, it starts at sundown. Our clock starts, our day starts uh, at midnight. So keeping that in mind, we're going to look at uh, the last week on Sunday was Palm Sunday. That was the 10th day of the month for them. And they brought the lamb to the house. That was the time when Jesus went into the house, the house of Jerusalem, the, the city of Jerusalem. And he went into the temple. He cleansed the temple. He taught and healed people throughout the day. And then Wednesday night, I mean, that would be actually Sunday, Sunday night, uh, Palm Sunday night, uh, he went back, uh, he went to uh, Bethany. Bethany. Bethany is about two miles away, according to John eleven eighteen. You can find his triumphal entry in Matthew 21, 1 through 20. We're not going to go into all these verses because we don't have time. We have other verses we're going to be covering in this class. But just to give you a little update on what led up to what we're going to cover. In John eleven eighteen, this is a Bethany was less than two miles away from uh, Jerusalem, basically. So it took him 20, 30 minutes to walk that, probably on average, less than an hour. Uh, and they walked it and spent the night in Bethany. And then they come back on uh, Monday morning. And uh, he's seen a fig tree on the way back. And this is where the notorious cursing of the fig tree happened. It was actually on Monday morning. And uh, it was a sample, an example of uh, the temple and God lifting his blessing off the temple and its uh, removal for a lack of fruit eventually. And uh, what happened there is uh, after he cursed the fig tree, he went in to the temple, that would be Monday morning, and cleansed it the second time during that week. And technically, it's the third time he cleansed the temple in the same manner. He cleansed it at the beginning of his ministry and twice here, both on Sunday and on Monday. So and then he continued to teach Monday in the temple. And then uh, Tuesday, Monday night, he went back to Bethany. And then Tuesday morning, he went, uh, and that's uh, Mark eleven twenty through 21, as uh, cleansing the temple and the fig trees in Mark eleven. 12 through 19, if you want to take notes to look those things up later. But in uh, Mark 11, 20 to 21, the disciples noticed Tuesday morning, this would be the 12th day, that uh, the fig tree had dried up so much that it was just almost ready to blow away. It was just a twig, basically. It was miraculously died immediately. They seen that, took note of that. And then they noticed this next day, which is Tuesday morning, as they're walking back into Jerusalem from Bethany, that it's, it's all just kind of almost disintegrated, almost gone. And what happened then is uh, he continued to teach and uh, heal people after he cleansed the temple. Um, well, he cleansed the temple twice, and that was, they probably gave up on the, on the thing. They didn't want any more ruckus, but they were just figuring out how to dispose of him, basically, because of the differences they had. And uh, by Tuesday midday, he went back to Bethany um, for lunch, basically, Simon's house, and was anointed there, that famous anointing of the uh, alabaster on his head. And then Tuesday evening, we're going to pick it up where we are now in that verse, 
and we're going to cover a lot of verses, but this would be towards the evening, and we're going to go into what day this is. It's the beginning of a Jewish day of preparation, which would be Wednesday. Uh, nightfall begins there Wednesday, but it's still our Tuesday evening, and it's approaching that. They're just looking at it. It's facing them right now at the beginning of this verse, and then they're asking Jesus a question, and then Jesus tells them what they're going to do. They're, they're probably heading back into Jerusalem already from Bethany, and uh, but they're not in the city yet when they have this discussion, as we'll see. So let's read Mark 14, 12 through 17. Go ahead, whoever's got it. We don't have much time. Uh, and the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare thou mayest eat of the Passover? And he sent forth two of the disciples and said unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And whoever shall he go in, say ye to the good men of the house. The master saith, Where is the the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will shew you a large upper room furnished and prepared there and make ready for us. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the, <clears throat> the first verse that starts out there. This is the first day of unleavened bread, and we discussed that last week. This wasn't the high holy feast of unleavened bread that follows the Passover because that celebrates them coming out of Egypt. That was actually on Friday. Wednesday is Passover, Friday, or Thursday is Passover during the daytime. Thursday is Passover, and then Friday during the daytime is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And uh, so basically this is leading up to that, but they had to get all the leaven out of the house on preparation day. So that's why they refer to this, I believe, as the first day of unleavened bread. There's no more leaven left in the house and uh, so they're not eating leavened bread starting this day or before. <clears throat> it's all preparation for the Passover. Also, it says when they kill the Passover lamb. So we know that that's not after the Passover. That's before the Passover. And that was the day of preparation. Part of the preparation for the Passover was killing the Passover lamb at the end of the day. So that would be the end of the preparation day. They killed the Passover lamb sometime between, and, uh, our time would be 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, somewhere in that vicinity, because after 6 o'clock it becomes Passover, which is a high holy Sabbath. They're not supposed to be doing work on that day. Only the priests are able to do that and are free to be able to do that. But anyways, um, bottom line is this is Tuesday evening, <clears throat> sometime close to nightfall, sunsetting time, towards the end of the day, and Jesus is telling them to go into the city and find this person he's going to prepare where they're going to have their Passover. Now, Jesus isn't going to eat the Passover with the disciples. He's actually going to introduce a whole new Passover. It's himself as a lamb. And he's going to introduce it. We call it the Lord's Supper. He's going to introduce it with the Lord's Supper and become our Passover. The Passover is actually a shadow of what he's about to do. And so the real Passover is what he's talking about sharing with his disciples from the New Testament that he's about to establish, the new covenant that he's about to put together, a blood covenant with his own blood. So that's the Passover he's referring to as uh, they're going to share it together. It's not the Jewish Passover because we'll see clearly that that happens after this is all over. And uh, he doesn't have the Jewish Passover with him because he's in a tomb. So we're going to take a look at this is Tuesday evening. We're going to look at John 13, 1 and 2. They're going, and uh, Jesus goes at night with his disciples and meets with them. Um, does, did you read that verse 17 before we leave Mark 14? Read verse 17. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. Okay, so in the evening, see that's Tuesday evening, he's coming with the twelve. So they're all there in the upper room that evening. Tuesday evening, and uh, that's uh, our Tuesday evening. It's the beginning of their Wednesday eve, uh, morning, or beginning of the day, you might say. Morning isn't technically uh, till you know, daylight, but, you know, the beginning of their Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. So see how confusing it is already? So bottom line is, if you keep track of it, it's not that confusing. It's just confusing to say and uh, see. But bottom line is, we're going to go to John 13, 
1 through 2. I'm going to actually look at the Lord's Supper. Ready? Yes. As soon as you got it, read it. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. How far am I going? Just two. Um. Okay. And support being ended, uh, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas, Iscariot, uh, Simon's son, to betray him. So you see, this is the night he's betrayed. It's the night he's having the Lord's Supper with the twelve. It's before the Passover. The Bible plainly says right here in John, and John says this over again. And uh, so this is not the Passover. It's not the time of the Passover. This is before the Passover, according to the Bible. And this uh, conclude in verse 30 of the same chapter, John 13, 30. Then having received the sup, went immediately out, and it was night. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So this is Judas leaving to go betray him. He's going to the high priest. They've already made a deal earlier in the day. And uh, so bottom line is that uh, he's going to betray him. He's leaving. They're getting ready to leave the upper room and go into the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane sometime around midnight. So now it's actually everybody's Wednesday. Uh, that, that time frame in which he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It would uh, be late in the evening around 11, 12 o'clock. And he's there for hours. And uh, we're going to read that in Mark 14, 37 through 46. And we'll see that he's there for hours praying and wrestling with his greatest temptation against his human nature. That basically he knew what was before him and now it's facing him. And he had a little struggle with that. He was tempted not to go through with it. His human nature didn't want to die and go through with the things that was about to happen. But he said, not my will, but your will be done. And he was stayed in prayer until he had that resolved. He had a free will, but he always chose what's right, always chose what's best. His soul was perfect. It was God, personality of God, but he had a human nature. Right. And the divine nature was also with him, encouraging him and enabling him to do miracles and stuff like that since he was baptized. But uh, at that time, he received the divine nature of the Holy Spirit. He had two natures, like every Christian does, but his nature, his human nature was pure. Our human nature is fallen. Uh, bottom line is not to get into that, but to see what he did that night and how long he was there. Let's look at Mark 14, 37 through 46. Go ahead and read that. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and said unto Peter, Simon, and said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could, couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wits they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest, it is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise up and let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. 46. And immediately while he yet spake, come of Judas, Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given him had given them a token, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. 
Okay, now in this class, we're just focusing on basically the timeline. There's a lot of details that happen in all these different events. A lot of teaching that goes on when he was in the temple and, and outside of the temple on the, on the hillside with his disciples that he's already done earlier. And so this timeline that we're establishing here, biblical timeline, for Jesus' last week, basically, the Passover week that Jesus experienced. Um, so basically, there it's well after midnight. He's uh, being taken away from the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see that he's taken in Luke 22, 63 and 67 by guard. Uh, now, he actually willingly went. Uh, he was actually in charge of the situation before they took him. They all fell down backwards. A bunch of stuff happened. He healed a, a guy's ear that was cut off. And different things happened during that time. So they didn't have uh, authority over him in reality. They realized... I'm hoping he comes along peacefully because after seeing all this stuff, they knew he had more power than they did. So bottom line is uh, he does go along peacefully, but it doesn't remain peaceful. And we're going to look at that. Uh, let's look at Luke 22, 63 through 67. Okay, the man that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophecy, who is that that smote you? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. How far am I going? The 67. The 67. And as soon as it was day, the elders and the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. Okay, so here he's by the guards. These are guards. They, they know how to fight. They're punching him. They're plucking his beard out. They're spitting on him. It's not a pleasant experience. And then after that, he goes, because finally they get their trial together, the Pharisees, some people in the morning, early in the morning, and uh, he's led over to them to be tried, basically. And uh, let's look at Mark 15, 1. After they try him and... Uh, try to get him to say something that they can get him with. They've already been trying to do that. They could never catch him in his words. And uh, bottom line is that uh, they considered him a blasphemer because he considered himself God. And so uh, he's delivered unto Pilate because they don't have authority to kill him, to crucify him. Um, so Mark 15, 1, let's look at that. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole council, Sanderian, reached the decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Okay, now this is Wednesday morning, first thing Wednesday morning. It's still Wednesday. Um, the Lord's Supper was the first thing Jewish time on Wednesday morning, our Tuesday night. But now it's Wednesday morning. It's getting to be a daybreak time. And uh, let's take a look at uh, John 18, 28. John 18, 28. Then let Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So notice this is clearly saying they didn't eat the Passover yet. Now Jesus had the Lord's Supper hours before this, at the beginning of the day, you might say. This is the uh, morning of that day that he had the Lord's Supper. He had it like somewhere around 7 o'clock or Tuesday night. Now it's approaching 6 o'clock. Everybody's Wednesday morning using Gentile clock. 
Uh, so bottom line is that um, we're going to see that they not only didn't eat the Passover, but John gives us the time in which this happened. Uh, the time when uh, basically um, he was crucified and things along that line. Uh, so John 19.14, let's take a look at that. This is not the time he was crucified, but this is the time they declare him to be crucified. The sentence was falling on him. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, by the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Okay, and we know that uh, following that, they, they declared to crucify him. And, uh, but the point is there, that it was saying that it was preparation day. You notice that? And uh, preparation day is mentioned over and over. That's a specific day. The last day of preparation was Wednesday. Preparation for the Passover. And it even says that very thing in one of the verses. So it's not uh, preparation for anything else but the Passover. This is the day before the Passover. This is Wednesday. Passover is Thursday. So this happened at the sixth hour. Now John is using the Gentile clock. That's 6 o'clock our time, 6 a.m. The rest of the Gospels are using the Jewish clock for this time frame of the, of the crucifixion. Um, John actually switches to use the Gentile uh, Jewish clock later when he's talking about the resurrection. We're probably not going to get that far and into that. But nevertheless, uh, what we're going to get into is the time frame of the crucifixion and the time frame that he was in the grave, biblically speaking. And so this is Wednesday, preparation day, 6 a.m. And he's before Pilate, and he's being judged, and they're declaring for him to be crucified. And let's take a look at Mark 15, 25. Once you see it, it's very clear, it's undisputable. He died on preparation day, was buried on preparation day, that was Wednesday. And he was exactly three days and three nights in the tomb, just like he said over and over. Uh, that would be Mark 15, 25. I have a different um, Bible. That's all right. It'll say... Okay, so Jesus is placed on the cross. Okay. It was nine o'clock in the morning when the crucifixion took place. Okay, that's an American version. That's not that uh, Mark uh, actually used a, uh, a different one, but that's fine. Um, it was the third hour when they crucified him. Okay, so that's where the confusion is. Your version actually clears that up. Yeah, right. uh, to say American time, uh, Gentile time, we think of it as 9 o'clock. Right. So that's why the, the more, more easy to understand in harmonizing version would say that. But the King James and many versions say it was the third hour. That's the third hour Jewish time. Their time started at their, their time started at six o'clock in the morning. Their first hour. Third hour would be nine o'clock. That's nine a.m. That's when he was put on the cross. Was nine a.m. The third hour Jewish time. See how the two clocks interlock? Yeah. They both work, and they're very significant in the end. You see how they actually add much more information because he's using two clocks. Yeah. And, uh, but if you don't understand that, you'll see you know, things are contradicting themselves. Mm -hmm. And it'll be very confusing. But when you see there's two clocks and where they're being used differently, mm -hmm. it becomes very clear and gives us a lot more insights to exactly what was going on, when it was going on. Uh, let's take a look at Luke 23, 44 and 46. Luke what? Luke 23, verses 44 through 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Okay, so the sixth hour is noon. There's six hour difference. So that's noon until 3 o'clock, the ninth hour. Uh, that's noon until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, that's how long he was on the well. He's on a uh, cross earlier. He'd already been on a cross uh, for since uh, nine o'clock, and so from nine to noon, and then from noon to three, it was dark. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, he uh, 
then died at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's the time that they actually killed, every day they killed an evening sacrifice. And when they killed that evening sacrifice is at the same time as Jesus died on the cross that day. Uh, they actually had a morning sacrifice as well. That was the time when uh, he was put on the cross, was during the morning sacrifice time, the daily sacrifices. And then there was the Passover sacrifices that, first, that uh, took place on this day. That was very uh, massive. Lots of sacrificing going on. Um, bottom line is that he died then at uh, 9 o'clock. And let's take a look at John 4, uh, 19, 31. John 19, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the, the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Uh, for the Sabbath day was a high day uh, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they may they might be taken away. Okay, so the Sabbath that he's talking about is a high Sabbath. It was Passover. Passover was a high Sabbath. Sabbath is not always Saturdays. Saturday is a weekly Sabbath, but Passover was a high Sabbath. And that's what they're talking about. Now, the two people on the sides of Jesus were still alive. Jesus gave up the ghost earlier than they did, um, and they, their legs would be broken so that they would suffocate on a cross. You would, if you're not able to push yourself up to breathe, you would tend to suffocate eventually. Uh, much faster death. Uh, yeah. But it was a gruesome, horrible death any way you looked at it. Yeah. Uh, Jesus uh, prophesied his legs would never be broken, no, no bones would ever be broken in the Psalms. Yeah. And they were not broken uh, because he was already dead. But it was preparation day. There's another mention of preparation day. Uh, let's look at Mark 15, 42 through 43. So it wasn't on Friday, which was a high, holy just as holy as the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which celebrates them coming out of Egypt. The Passover celebrates the Passover um, because the, uh, the Lamb's blood was on a door. It passed over a house, the death angel did. The next day, the 15th day, which will be Friday this year, this year and that year, uh, it was actually the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's when they actually left Egypt. And that was also a high holy feast. Let's take a look. So preparation was preparation for these days. That was Wednesday. Uh, Mark 15, 42 and 43. Let's take a look at that. And now we give no excuse because it was a preparation. That is the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Amamarty, a honorable counselor, which also which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in bodily unto Pilate and carved the body of Jesus. So this is Joseph of Armandrasia, whatever you pronounce that. He was going after Jesus died. This would be after three o'clock in the afternoon, but before six o'clock, that's the end of their day, and when the Sabbath would begin, to ask if he could have the body, and Pilate gives it to him, and he goes to take it to a special place uh, that he's well aware of. I imagine it seems to be his own uh, sepulcher, uh, grave, uh, never was used. And uh, so let's take a look at Luke 23, 52 through 54. It was nearby, it was in the garden, there was a garden there, and he was rushing, because he needed not only to ask Pilate, you know, during this three-hour period, but then to get the body and take it and uh, put it in the tomb. So, uh, and then seal the tomb with the stone, the rock. Luke 23, verses 52 through 54. And you see, once again, and this is Luke saying it's Preparation Day. All four Gospels say it's Preparation Day. The man went in unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he Hold it. Did we just read that? No. 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 Okay. Go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry. Uh, Luke 23, 52 through 54. That's right, God. The man went in unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. 
He took the stone and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the sepulchre that was hewn in a stone, wherein never man before was laid. And the day was the preparation and and the Sabbath drew on. So this is preparation day, and by the Sabbath drawn on, I mean it's getting close. It's coming. He can see it. It's right before him. And uh, so that's why it means it's drawing on. It's coming. It's there. And uh, so this is still preparation day. He's put in the tomb. And let's look at John 19, 41 and 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden... A new, um, uh, what is that again? Sepulchre, maybe? Sepulchre, or two? Yeah, sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. Are uh, we going to 42? Yes. There lay, there lay they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews, preparation day for the uh, sepulchre was near and so they didn't have any time to waste, but it was still preparation day. And he was put in the tomb. And it is my opinion that they was there just in time and that this tomb stone was rolled and sealed the tomb right at the transition from preparation day to Passover. So at the very end, because it says over and over, this is approaching. It's right there. We've got to finish this stuff up. We've got to get everything done. We're done. Seal the tomb. Whoa, we just got done. And as, I got, as God would have it, timing wise, at the end of preparation day, the tomb is sealed. But now, just a little bit later, which would be 7 o'clock, is a little bit later than 6 o'clock, the Jewish Pharisees are saying, you know what? Who's at the tomb? Who's guarding the tomb? How do we know somebody's not going to steal the body? So this is after preparation day has concluded, before the Sabbath of Passover has actually started, but it already is started. It's the next day, but they're not actually having their Passover yet. So they're sort of, they're the priests, so they can get away with certain things, uh, work-wise and different things. So they're approaching, and they're actually desperate now to go to Pilate. And we'll see that Matthew, which is the fourth gospel, what mentions Preparation Day. It's just concluded, and now they're going to make sure there's guards on that tomb. Let's look at Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verses 60 through 2. Verse 62 through 66. Now, preparation day is Wednesday. Uh, so keeping that in mind, this is the day after Wednesday. This is the first beginning of Thursday. Uh, so they're sort of uh, just got done. They're not, they're not waiting or wasting any time. They find out he's where? Who took him? He's in, he, where, who's, who's over there? And they're, they're, they're desperate to make sure that nothing's going to go wrong as they're expressing the pilot. Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Go ahead and read that. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, for he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as you can. Okay. So um, they're actually putting a watch there. It's a, it's a Roman guard watch. Uh, so the tomb is guarded. They're actually checking to make sure the body's in there. And they seal it with a Roman seal to make sure nothing's going to move uh, until the third day it doesn't move. And then on the third day, everything changes. Now Jesus, they said, uh, he predicted he would rise from the third day. Now, he actually predicted several things. We don't have time to get into the verses, I don't think. Uh, maybe we can, a couple of them. Uh, let's look at Mark 8, 31. We'll push the time a little bit. Mark 8, 31. I think this is King James. Let's read it in King James. 
uh, because some uh, modern translations once again try to harmonize this when it shouldn't have been. They actually changed the wording in such a way that it's not correct any longer. <clears throat> they try to make it both the same statement when it's not a repeat of the same statement. It's two different statements, Mark 8.31 and Mark 9.31. So we're going to look at 8.31 first. Let's go ahead and read that. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. After three days. That's after the conclusion of three days he's going to rise again. Now look at Mark 9, 31, next chapter. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed. He shall rise the third day. The third day he's going to rise. So that's on the third day he's rising. Sounds like a contradiction. Most people think it is a contradiction. It's not a contradiction because they're using two clocks. Two clocks illustrate that he was going to rise after three days, which is after Saturday, six o'clock in the evening, Jewish time. That's the beginning of that's the end of the third day and the beginning of the fourth day or whatever you want to say. Um, that's the beginning of their first day of the week. It's the end of their Sabbath day it is uh, sundown, Saturday night. So bottom line is that it's after three days, Jewish time, and yet it's on the third day, Gentile time. So both these statements are correct, which narrows the resurrection of the time frame to a, a six hour period before midnight on the third day still, and after mid, uh, six o'clock in the afternoon, which would be that'd be Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday of preparation. Uh, it's, it's actually a Wednesday. When's Saturday? It's actually Saturday afternoon, six o'clock. It's after that. That would be the third day because he's in the tomb at the night of Passover. That's all day. Well, it's all night Passover and all day Passover, all night. That's Thursday. All night Friday and all day Friday. That's Feast of Unleavened Bread. All night uh, Sabbath day, which is Saturday, and all day Sabbath day. That's the third day and third night. That's just as this is Matthew 12, 40. Three days and three nights, which concludes Saturday night at 6 o'clock. So it's after those three days, and yet it's still on the third day, Jewish uh, Gentile time, before midnight. And uh, we see that because Mary Magdalene went there first thing she could right after the Sabbath had closed. We don't have time to read that one, but we'll close out with uh, Luke 20. Well, we can't, don't have time to read that one either. Uh, but bottom line is that in Luke 24, 13 to 21, Jew, uh, Jesus walks with some people. And they say all these things happen on, and they, 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 people had already mentioned that they heard the women's testimony. And the, the fact that the body's missing, they were confused. But the bottom line is that uh, they said, uh, we don't know what to think of it. And Jesus started talking to them and stuff. He says, uh, don't you know what? He was crucified. And this is the third day since that he was crucified. So that was still before midnight when he's talking to these people. Mary Magdalene had been there four times. Three of those times were before midnight. This was before midnight. And uh, Jesus said he would be three days and three nights. And he was. And the Bible comes together nicely when you have a few details straightened out. Like what clock they're using, when they're using that. We're going to have to close here. We're out of time. And uh, so, bottom line is, the Bible is true. Jesus is accurate. And when we follow these things, we'll have more light on the whole situation. So, it's all contained in my book. If you want to read it, there's two chapters dedicated to that. Um, crucifixion as well as Resurrection Day. So, it's Deep Foundations. You can find it on Amazon. So, God bless you all. Uh, we're going to conclude this.